It'll end badly. <laughs> That's... Um, of course, I, I don't make predictions as a rule, but if, if we can only, uh, the predictions I can make are sort of somewhat like Charles Dickens' Christmas story. I can talk about the, the future as it might be, but I can't guarantee it'll be that way. But the current picture of the future of the universe, if the expansion of the universe continues to accelerate, and we have no reason to believe it won't, then everything we see now will one day disappear. All the galaxies we can now see will be eventually moving away from us faster than the speed of light in a time period of about a trillion years. And the entire rest of the universe will disappear before our very eyes. And then the stars in our galaxy will burn out and the universe will become cold, dark, and empty. And that's the future. In fact, as my late friend Christopher Hitchens put it when I explained this to him, and we were talking about something from nothing, he said, uh, well, you know, uh, it, the real answer to the question why is there something rather than nothing is just wait, there won't be for long. Well, I think the point is that some people think that learning about the universe is kind of esoteric and unrelated to our lives, but it's intimately related to our own origins if we ask why are we here or where do we come from. The very fact that the atoms inside of our body were all inside of stars and experienced the most violent explosion known in nature, supernova, and many, maybe many times that the atoms in your left hand may have come from a different star than your right hand, those things to me are, are indeed poetic because it really means we are the cosmos and the cosmos is us. And so these questions aren't just purely academic. If we want to understand ourselves, we have to look out there. Well, that statement is made by people who are ignorant about science. Uh, the, uh, Richard Feynman said it very well. He said, understanding how a rainbow works doesn't make it any less beautiful. It makes it more beautiful. Because the, 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 the wonder of how the universe really works is, it, it, it exceeds our own imagination. And knowing, not just, not just seeing the beauty of the universe in the night sky, which, it's, which is, of course, awe-inspiring and was awe-inspiring to Neanderthals, probably, but it's much more uh, 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 awe-inspiring when you actually understand it's just the tip of a cosmic iceberg. That it's the stars we see are in our galaxy, but our galaxy is one of 400 billion galaxies in the universe. I mean, the things, there's, there can be nothing more awe-inspiring or spiritually fulfilling than the wonder of our universe. And those who argue that science kills wonder have just turned their minds off learning about how the universe really works in the first place. Well, there's always been great dangers for mankind, I suppose, in one way or another. It's amazing we're still here. Certainly, nuclear weapons are, remain a huge danger, and one that, unfortunately, the public and, and the government doesn't seem to think about enough. I'm co-chairman of the board of the Bolton Atomic Scientists, which was created in 1946 by Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer to, to warn the public of the dangers of nuclear war, and we still, we still are doing that, setting the doomsday clock every year or two. Doomsday, I mean, nuclear weapons are a threat, and until we get rid of them, they will one day be used. And I suspect sometime in the century they will be used against a civilian population, and it will, and it will affect things more than, than people can imagine. Uh, it's amazing they haven't been used in 65 years since the Second World, Second World War. But I think there are many other threats that you know we are bringing upon ourselves, and, and obviously climate change, uh, which is something of great interest to me, is a huge global threat for humanity. It's not going to wipe out civilization like, like a global nuclear war could, but it's going to change the world. It already is changing the world. It's already happening, and we're already in the world 2.0. And the question is, how disastrous will those changes be, and how can we cope with them? Because we're sort of already over the climate cliff. Forget the fiscal cliff. We're already over the climate cliff. And, uh, and now it's a matter of trying to figure out how to catch up. Um, you know, there are other, obviously, concerns when we, when we have new technology. Biotechnology always ha 
has the risk of bioterrorism. And every new technology is scary, but exciting at the same time. And whether it's useful or dangerous depends upon uh, how we use it and our intelligence and also our foresight. And uh, I think that biotechnology will have incredible benefits for humankind. And whether it reaps incredible dangers will depend on our wisdom as a species. But um, I'm not necessarily optimistic. It depends on the day. And as a friend of mine says, I'm a pessimist, but that's no reason to be gloomy. Well, well it's a difficult concept. The idea that nothing is unstable is a very difficult concept because the concept of nothing is a difficult concept. But nothing in physics is not so simple. And one has to think about it in various ways. And the simplest version of nothing, which is empty space, is certainly unstable. Due to the laws of quantum mechanics, there are all sorts of things going on, virtual particles popping in and out of existence and every second. And ultimately, once you add gravity into the mix, you can show that if you wait long enough, empty space will start producing particles. And it's allowed by the laws of physics. So, it's, so the, real quest, the real surprise is not why is there something rather than nothing, but the real surprise would be why is there nothing? But if there were, we wouldn't be asking the question. But it gets even more interesting than that, because in fact, uh, there are other kinds of nothing. That you may, can imagine no space and no time. But again, it's possible with, with quantum gravity that space and time themselves can pop into existence spontaneously. And so, um, in fact, again, if, you, if, if, if there is a multiverse, and, and, and then one is guaranteed that universes will be created from nothing out of it. Do you think we'll end up finding that there is a multiverse? Do you think that's well, I think the current best pictures of particle physics suggest that there's a multiverse, that, that our universe is not unique. Um, we, it's, it's a suggestion, and it's, it's highly plausible, uh, and it addresses scientific as well as maybe philosophical conundrum, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. I'm, I'm agnostic about things that I don't know anything about. Of course, scientific literacy means understanding not only how the world works, but the consequences of our actions. And if we don't understand the consequences of our actions, we can't make good policy. So, so central to good policy making in government is an understanding of, of the implications of science and technology. It's, they go hand in hand. There's nothing more important. Well, everyone has their own reasons. I'm an, I'm an anti-theist as well, um, in the sense that I, I cannot say with certainty that there's no God, but I can say with certainty that I wouldn't want to live in a universe with one. Um, and I think the reason that scientists become atheists in that regard is that they look at the way their universe works and there's no evidence for purpose or, or, or intelligence behind the universe. There's no evidence for, for some divine purpose. And... They study the universe very carefully, and with no evidence, there's no reason to, to believe it. And the, and the postulate is so outrageous and requires such baggage that it's not a simple thing to just sort of say, oh, it might happen. It's not like saying there's a teapot orbiting Jupiter, which is stupid, but just doesn't require much. Putting a deity in requires a whole character of the universe for which there's no evidence. So scientists tend to... It's not a matter of belief or not belief. We just, if there's no evidence, it's highly unlikely. I also like the argument where a lot of people say that believing in aliens is the same as believing in miracles, but aliens don't require you to break the laws of physics. Well, there's a huge okay. difference. Aliens probably exist. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, they haven't been coming to visit us, but it'd be unlikely. That I've given the number of stars and planets in the u universe if life didn't exist elsewhere. But miracles are impossible by definition and by... By practice, they've never been observed. So you put the two together, and uh, it's strongly suggestive. Well, philosophy, when it was merged with science, was a, was a central part. Philosophy is reflection, you know, reflecting on the knowledge we learn. But the, it doesn't generate knowledge. The knowledge about how the universe works comes from science, and the philosophers can talk about it and think about it and maybe even add insight. 
but they don't generate knowledge. And in that sense, once philosophy became divorced from science, once natural philosophy separated into natural science and philosophy, philosophy started become, becoming marginalized, and it's been more and more marginalized ever since. And philosophers aren't thrilled with the fact, but it's just a fact. I see no evidence that we're on the brink of a new age. We're, we're, we're always discovering remarkable things about the universe, and they have changed the way we think about the universe more than anything else. But, but society moves at a slow pace, and I certainly seem, see no evidence when I look around me and society at large that there are any trends that make me optimistic. Well, humans are rational and irrational. That's what makes us human. If we were purely rational, the light world would be easier to handle, I suppose, but maybe less interesting. Uh, we have to accept the inherent irrationality of human beings uh, when we try and understand how to move things forward. That purely rational arguments don't always work, although in the long run I think they, they, they are the best way of addressing things. Uh, but, we, uh, but we have to recognize that we're we're with products of our evolutionary heritage, and irrationality is an essential part of it, and so that's life. And we might as well, like most things, understand ourselves. Perhaps that's the best. We can understand, if the better we understand ourselves, the better we can cope with our own irrationality. Well, of course, there's more poetry in the universe than there is in the minds of poets. The universe continues to surprise us because it has more imagination than we do. The, 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 there is nothing more poetic than the story of nature, which is one of the reasons why I write about it. Well, I think it's a matter of growing up. I think when you're a child, you tend to think everything is there for you, and as you grow up, you realize it isn't. As a species, we need to grow up and, and recognize that, that indeed the universe is a strange and often violent place, and the earth isn't made for us to survive, that our survival and our, and our flourishing depends upon our own actions. The sooner we recognize that, the more, we can, the more quickly we can take rational actions to preserve and enhance our own future as a species. Well, I think that people get comfort in old ideas and are threatened by new ones. It's just a general policy. And, and, and um, if, if, you are, if you find that you get great comfort in certain ideas, you are loath to, to throw them out. And I think that's a generic tendency of human beings. And one of the great benefits of science is it teaches us how to throw out ideas that don't work, which is one of the reasons why I would love science to be more generally understood. But religion is based on knowing the answers before you ask the question. So by definition, it is as a human activity runs counter to rationality and science, which is one of the reasons why religion is so pernicious in our society. Yeah, I mean, that's the great thing about science. And I, I've said it, and, and, it's, and you'll hear it be said to, in, in a number of places, that I hope that, that, that every student at some point in their education has the experience of having some idea they hold central to their being, so central that without it they couldn't imagine living, proved to be wrong, because that opens your mind. And that's what's great about science. No matter how beautiful a theory is, if it's wrong, you throw it out like yesterday's newspaper. And that is the liberation that science provides for all of us which I wish upon everybody. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, I want people to be fascinated by the universe as it really is and the revolutionary discoveries we've made in the last 40 years, which is what the book's about. The universe, the real universe is far more fascinating than the universe of myth and superstition. So I also want people to realize that that this fundamental question that seems to perplex people or make people think it's necessary to have a, a divine intelligence governing the universe, that, that everything we see presumably arose from nothing, is possible by the laws of physics. And so I want to confront that, that what I believe is a misperception from theology and philosophy over the years. But that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a secondary thing. For me, I'm most interested in exciting people about the, to learn about the real universe. I think once they learn how fascinating the real universe is, then inevitably um, they'll throw away their childish beliefs.